harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Jacob, do you promise respect and obedience to me and my successors? I do. It is a simple yet powerful invitation, not unlike the one Christians believe was spoken 2,000 years ago by Christ himself. I do. Come, follow me. Here among the natural beauty of these spacious grounds, a young man begins his spiritual journey to discover whether he really has what it takes to be a Catholic priest in a modern world. But despite the beauty and spiritual awakening, the transformation can be challenging. I think that, you know, what the most challenging thing is that you become something that is very countercultural. So your entire life, you know, you're told different things that are going to make you happiness, you know, that are going to bring you happiness. You know, you need to possess this item because it's, it has this sort of reification quality about it. Um, but in actuality, you know, I don't believe that those things bring us a true sense of happiness. You know, there's a, there's a, temp, there's a temporary happiness with uh, the receiving of some sort of material good or perhaps abiding by a cultural norm. But when it comes down to it, um, the permanency that you gain out of growing in a relationship with God is far, far greater than anything that could be provided for us elsewhere. That's lasting, that's real. Right. Catholic seminarians are profoundly affected by the mystical notion of serving as a link between Christ and the faithful. So does it boil down to having the opportunity for service? Well, I think it's, it's, thing is, it's more than, it's thing is it's more than service. I mean, at the heart of it, it's service, but that service is all surrounded by love. I mean, if you had to use one word to describe Jesus' message, it, it's love and it's a radical love. And that's something that's, I've always intrigued you know, people, you know, for the last 2,000 years, and it continues to intrigue me today. I do. Do you resolve to celebrate faithfully and reverently in accord with the church's tradition, the mysteries of Christ, especially the sacrifice of the Eucharist and the sacrament of reconciliation for the glory of God and the sanctification of the Christian people? I do. But what does it mean to become a priest in the Roman Catholic Church today? And we're looking for someone who's um, really kind of a gentleman, you know, someone who has um, personal traits which will allow the gospel to shine through. Mm. So a man who's unapproachable, who never laughs, who is not gentle, who is not kind, he can have all the theological background in the world, but he's going to fail at connecting the gospel to people's lives. The hardest thing I think for us personally as priests is kind of the roller coaster effect of between joy and sorrow. You could be with a family for a funeral, a very intense, sad, and, and uh, you know, grieving time, and then go right into a baptism where you're suddenly in such joy and, and ecstasy. When they're assigned to a parish, they take that very seriously. And there are a lot of demands. There are fewer priests. And because of that, the demands get even larger. And it's hard for them to kind of sometimes make good decisions on what's best for them if they're going to be good ministers for a long time. The, the seminary today um, um, has uh, the various dimensions, human dimension, uh, uh, spiritual dimension, psychological dimensions that, that, have, been, uh, that have been all placed uh, at the disposal of this young man, informing him for this moment in, in terms of, uh, of his priesthood. Certainly when one is ordained a priest, you are ordained for life. There is actually an ontological change, we say. Something happens to the person's spirit, the person's soul. The Lord Jesus Christ, whom the Father anointed with the Holy Spirit and power, guard and preserve you. It is a very sacred and public expression of humility, obedience, and service. Milwaukee Holy Orders, the making of a priest. Hello, I'm Mark Segrist. Scripture tells us that Christ called 12 common men to help lead his ministry of salvation and service, and to a large extent, such is the case today. During the next 30 minutes, you'll have the opportunity to meet several seminarians who, despite their vigorous training for the priesthood, have the ability to express their own spirituality and vocation on a very personal level, not unlike the original 12 apostles themselves. I got it. I just got enough for this one right here. Now there's the uh, tulip right here mixed with this bush. I don't even know what kind of plant this is. The apostles knew the meaning of hard work. They were fishermen by trade. These young men aren't casting nets into the sea. 
but their summer jobs can be just as physical. 20-year-old Dominic Tarabasi IV is in his third year of studies for the priesthood. 22-year-old David Zampino Jr. is in his fourth year of formation. There's a weed attached to it. How challenging is the, the formation process so far for you, the spiritual and academic uh, formation? Yeah, academically, I, I feel you know, confident uh, in my skills. Uh, I'm a very hardworking student, and I've always, been, you know, I've always got good grades, so I was always a good student. Um, but you know, spiritually and you know, human, you know, that, that change and the reshaping that's required you know, it takes a lot of energy, and, and the change is, isn't always a fun thing, because you have there's, there's this constant reflection you need to go through, and you see the areas of your life that need work, mm. and you know you look at the virtues and say, well, how do, how do, how does my life compare to you know these virtues? How does my life compare to Christ? And you know you start have to fix fixing those areas, and it ain't easy. How many guys are out there, young men, walking the streets right now, thinking about the priesthood, but not taking the step perhaps that you have? I think there are many men out really? there. Really? Many men out there. I mean, I've, as a seminarian, um, I've become a little bit of a, of a tool, you know, oftentimes, where guys will come to me and ask me about it. Um, I know probably in the past month I've spoken to four different men who you know, are interested in the priesthood and interested in becoming priests, but they don't, you know, quite have the courage or they're not sure if they'll make good priests. You know, they have all of these questions. Um, and one of my goals is to try to bridge this gap between seminarians and men who are discerning priesthood. On this late morning in May, Dominic and David are tending to the flower bed in front of St. Francis de Sales Seminary. Nice work, David. <laughs> Digging up some old roots is presenting a bit of a challenge. You have a pull tool? The seminary grounds are extensive and require constant attention. There's never a shortage of work to be done. The students take special care in maintaining the old cemetery in the rear of the property. The holy ground is often used for personal prayer and quiet reflection. So Dominic, tell me about uh, the woods back here, they're gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, the woods at St. Francis are really a, a beautiful place to be. Um, very, very holy grounds, and I think highly conducive towards uh, prayer life and, and meditation. What do you pray about at this stage of your formation? Um, well, you know, in, in priestly discernment, I think one of the, the biggest things is, is trying to discover, you know, God's will in your life and to remain open to that. So something that I, I'm constantly asking the Lord for is to, to keep me open to His will so that um, I can answer His calling and ultimately live my life in a way that is in conformity with His will. So when you're in the seminary program, it's, it's not certain that you're going to be a priest, but you're, 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 you're thinking seriously about it and that's the way it's right. supposed to be? Right, right. You, you, you took that step. You know, you took a leap of faith. Um, you really, I know at least personally, I, I believe myself to be called to be a priest. Um, you know, the moment I know is the second after the, the Archbishop lays his hands on me at ordination, you know, when you actually become a priest and receive that, that indelible mark on your soul. But yeah, seminary is, is a time for discernment, um, for staying open to God's will, and really trying to, to hear that voice. In your prayer life, how do you actually surrender yourself to God's will on a daily basis? Well, I think when you, when you take into, um, into heart your prayer life, um, it also begins to affect your actions and the things that you do. And in order to more greatly surrender yourself, you begin actually living out the gospel in your life. Um, and you allow the Spirit to sort of take you over through both your actions, through your faith, and, and through your prayer. Yeah, yeah. You said you were discerning your call to priesthood. Right. What, w w explain that to me. Um, what, kind of, uh, what kind of doubts enter into your mind at this, at this part of your journey? Um, well, I mean, there are, there are difficulties. Um, I'm aware that I'm young, you know, I'm 20 years old, and I'm, I'm making very important decisions. Um, so there, there's definitely a dynamic of, you know, is this really what God wants in my life? 
Um, you know, do I have enough life experience now to be making these decisions? Um, and I think I was fortunate enough to, to live a very well-rounded life before entering into the college seminary. Um, so I very much believe myself to be called to be a seminarian and to be in seminary, discerning God's will. I think that the best answer I can give is that part of my discernment process is saying, you know, well, I, I am so confident, I can't, I can't explain to you how confident I feel like I'm going to be ordained. And you really are. You feel I, 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 it's, I, I can't explain to people how confident I feel. I've, I've never felt this confident in anything. It's a fascinating discipline, wanting something so badly you can taste it, and yet being willing to give it up if you sense the divine is pulling you in another direction. But you feel some doubt. No, there's not that some doubt. I, I feel like because I'm in this period of discernment, I must always be open, you know, because what, what if it's, David, I want you to be here. You know, what if the, that's the plan? David, I want you to be here for this amount of time and then do something else. And you're talking about the divine. Absolutely. So it's not as much your decision in a prayerful sense as, as it will be God's decision whether you complete the program and you actually receive sacrament of holy orders. Uh, that's, how, that's how I see it. Um, and that's why I feel so confident that I don't, I don't, that's why I don't see this plan changing anytime soon. So, Scripture tells us that Christ called common men to assist him in his ministry of salvation and service. To what extent is, is that still happening today? Are common men still being called to priesthood? Yeah, I think so. And oftentimes, I think it's funny if you talk to families um, that have maybe multiple boys and one of them is in the seminary as a priest. I would say to a large extent their moms would say that was not the boy I would have picked to be in the seminary. They would have picked some other son, you know, because he seems to have more of the, the external qualities in the sense that maybe more prayerful, things like that. Father Peter Berger is the former vocations director for the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. He's now pastor of St. Mary's Visitation Parish in Elm Grove. When it comes to the making of a priest, Father Peter has an intriguing perspective. He believes strongly that attitude is essential to successful ministry. And I think, um, I think one of the reasons Christ calls the common man, so to speak, in this case, the unextraordinary one, is because it gives him room to work, if that makes any sense. It's like St. Paul says, you know, it's when I'm weak that I'm strong. You know, that in some sense it's, it's when one doesn't have a lot of, they've got the qualities, but they're not necessarily excelling in, I don't know, maybe that's complicated to say. Um, I think it allows room for Christ to work. If, if it's only excellent, so-called by the world's end, it's the excellent ones who would step forward, um, there's always the danger of becoming prideful and starting to attribute the success of one's ministry to oneself. The common priest, so to speak, recognizes that's not him, it's Christ that's doing things through him. And that's a powerful thought, the fact that common men are being called upon to do such spiritual work. That's because I'm common myself, <laughs> so that's why I've thought about it. Do you it. feel yourself? I mean, oh, you know, sure. The Roman Catholic Church is in need of men who are both common and gifted. Future priests will have to rebuild a faith shaken by sex abuse scandals, legal turmoil, financial decay, and declining clergy. Despite those challenges, young men like Dominic Tarabasi IV and David Zampino Jr. still answer the call. Now make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. You know, that's, that's what I want to be, you know, I pray it every day. As a seminarian, you know, how is the image of the priesthood altered now because of these different occurrences? Like, that, those, are, those are difficult things to deal with. But ultimately, like, that's not what the priesthood is about. You know, that's not what the Catholic Church is about. You know, we don't stand for these things. You know, we are the institution that is, that is trying to uh, be the face of Christ. Father Peter Berger says the ongoing evaluation of candidates for the priesthood is extensive. On the formation level, obviously that begins with my own office, you know, um, asking questions about psychosexual development. You know, part of the application process is um, a two-day psychological battery of tests and clinical interview. Um, while they are here, you know, there is a psychologist who's on as part of the formation faculty. 
um, if a guy has things. We have no, no problem or compulsion kicking somebody out, you know, if there's a problem. Each year they go through a, a battery of evaluations. They're evaluated by the faculty, they're evaluated by their fellow seminarians, they're evaluated by me. And after those years of preparation and evaluation, uh, at the end we come and say, now is this candidate truly ready to be ordained? And if the faculty, the fellow students, if myself, we all say, yes they are, we bring them here to the cathedral to be ordained. Got it. Yeah. Dominic and David think they have what it takes to carry on the work of the apostles. Of the formation process for priesthood is a time for discernment as well as spiritual and academic discipline. It requires plenty of nurturing and patience, not unlike being good stewards of the grounds of St. Francis Seminary itself. You intercede for us at the right hand of the Father. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. 25-year-old Philip Shoemaker could be on a career path to a number of professions. Living out the gospel is his chosen field. I am the Good Shepherd, and I know mine, and mine know me. Philip Shoemaker is in his final year of training for the Catholic priesthood. He's using it to polish his skills for liturgy, preaching, and service to others. Good. I need to open right. it. What year are you? You need me to open it? Oh, here you go. I'm sorry. There it is. As a transitional deacon, Philip has already begun wearing a clerical collar people are taking notice. It's a bit of an adjustment, but good preparation for his future role. I, you know, I've had multiple people since I've had it on uh, walk up and just, you know, say, "Could I'd like to speak with you for a little bit. Now, as a deacon, I can't, you know, offer confession or anything like that to them, but I can, um, I can listen to them and I can talk with them. And sometimes that's all people need is just someone to listen to them, you know, someone who can listen to them non-judgmentally. You know, I was at Mass the other day and, and someone walked up to me and they just said, um, this was right before, and they said they were just having a hard time. And I, he didn't necessarily go into any details, but I just sat and listened for a while and he cried a little bit. But it was, it was just a nice moment to sit there and just, you know, be with someone in need. When ordaining new clergy, Archbishop Jerome Listecki emphasizes the impact of their priestly presence in the community. You have been asked to look at yourself as others see you and personally assess your interior life. All of this has contributed to forming you for this moment of ordination as priest to serve the church. With your goodness, we have bread to offer, which earth is given. Deacon Phillips serves on the religious staff of Three Holy Women Parish in Milwaukee. Uh -huh. And then you're done for the summer. Huh? Awesome. Then we come back middle school. Yeah, you do. That's right. You're going to be in sixth grade. Reaching out to Catholic East Elementary students during a school outing is part of his pastoral formation. Father Tim Kitsky is pastor of Three Holy Women Parish. He's also serving as Philip's mentoring priest during his final year of study. So we're all pulling together, I think most of all to be kind of a, an, a, a source of real encouragement for him. The priests perhaps that you and I grew up with in the church, Father, would they understand or even be able to relate to what contemporary ministry is today? Well, I, I think, uh, Mark, obviously, you know, you know it's, it's real hard to say that I could know what they were thinking, but what I would have to say is they, they would be amazed at the variety of different things we need to be involved in now. And then also in the past in terms of formation, even this whole teaching parish model or having the deacon follow a priest around for a period of a year, kind of that intern model that other occupations have used, I think that in the past, the seminary was kind of the hot house for them. And I think it's much more realistic now at a very early stage in formation to involve the formation, the priestly formation of candidates in a situation in which they're able to actually encounter the realities of the life that, that we're going to be living. But what I look for is I look for the priest being a man of prayer. Um, I look for the, the, the priest being faithful to the teaching of the, of the church um, and um, an openness to the, to the service of the people of God. Now you take those and then place that with one vision that he's to live his life directed towards holiness. Then you've got the makings really of, uh, of God being able to use that individual as an instrument to bring many um, uh, uh, to literally understand the mystery of God in the world. The blood of Christ. Amen. <laughs> Throughout his training, the Catholic seminarian focuses on four important pillars for the priesthood. 
They include the qualities of being pastoral, spiritual, intellectual, and human for effective ministry. Well, I think probably the most challenging would be the uh, intellectual, to make sure that they get the grade, that they uh, make sure they pass all their courses. But also, I think the other three are very important as well, to develop their own um, human personality, realizing that they're going to be interrelating with people throughout their life. Uh, their pastoral, making sure that they're able to uh, preach the good news to people, to uh, have that pastoral sense, to celebrate the sacraments, and of course spiritual, always working on their relationship with God. Watching Philip Shoemaker having fun with the Catholic East kids reminds me of my own grade school experience. In the 50s and 60s, there were enough priests in a parish to make recess a regular part of their daily rounds. Today, it's not unusual for a priest to be in ministry to several congregations. Deacon Philip is very candid about the discipline of his vocation. At this stage of your formation, how would you define what priesthood is all about? Mm -hmm. For me, I think um, priesthood is certainly service to others, service um, serving God's people, but I also think uh, one of the biggest ways I've understood it in my own life is a call to holiness, is a call to be closer to God, um, to really grow in a relationship with Him. I'm living all by myself, it's, so it's, you know, can be a lonely life. Um, uh, I find, for example, for my own life, I find um, the married life and a family, I find that very attractive. Um, but ultimately, I'm happy, I'm really happy doing this because I think it's what God's called me to do, and there's certainly certain elements of sacrifice that you have to make in every life. Our priests are normal human beings. They deal with life issues like all of us deal with, and oftentimes because of their priesthood, their ministry, they have trouble confiding in the right people, so uh, part of my job is I'm available to them pretty much 24-7. Father Patrick Heppy serves as vicar for clergy in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. He says part of his job involves coaching other priests how to maintain a balanced life. Their priestly ministry is characterized, of course, by spirituality, good health, and uh, you know that mental, the mental aspects of keeping your brain sharp and things like that. So I try to work with all those areas. I absolutely love what I'm doing, and I want to keep doing it for a long time. And if I'm going to be keep doing it for a long time, I have to be healthy in body, mind, and spirit. And I tell that to the priests as well. But you know, when you have demands from parishioners, when they're looking for a funeral, a wedding, when they need some time just to talk, you kind of it's easy to say, well, you know, I'll. I'll do exercise tomorrow, I'll be twice as long, and that never happens. You know, you go out, they invite you for dinner, and you eat the bad, the bad food, and your cholesterol goes high, and your weight gets heavy. It's not going to be there. Your longevity in ministry is not going to happen. So part of my job is working with those issues as well. Um, I just began to think that sometimes in order to be the Good Shepherd, to bring the good news to the people, we have to leave our own comfort zones. We have to go out to places we might not normally go to in order to bring Christ to that place. Deacon Philip Shoemaker feels well trained to preside and pastor in the Roman Catholic tradition. Ordination is only months away. Perhaps the simple words, come follow me, are meant for him too. The Holy Order's liturgy is a high church affair filled with emotion and spiritual significance. He said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. Ryan Joseph Cruz. On this Saturday morning in May, six candidates are presented to Archbishop Jerome Listecki for ordination to the priesthood. It's one of the largest classes at the cathedral in recent memory. After inquiry among the Christian people and upon the recommendation of those responsible, I testify that they have been found worthy. Relying on the help of the Lord God and our Savior Jesus Christ, we choose these, our brothers, for the order of the priesthood. Thank you. During his homily, Archbishop Lestecki sums up the importance of their basic priestly mission. 
You give us hope that the opportunities to encounter the Lord Jesus will increase for the people of God. That's followed by the examination of candidates. And with him, to consecrate yourselves to God for the salvation of all. I do with the help of God. The promise of obedience. Rand, do you promise respect and obedience to me and my successors? I do. May God, who has begun the good work in you, bring it to fulfillment. A public display of humility, submission, and rebirth. Praying face down on the floor of the cathedral is an incredible experience. And I don't know what everybody does during that moment of, of time when they're lying on the floor. Um, I had one constant prayer while I was lying there, and that was that Jesus make my heart like his own. And I hope that I'm filled with the gifts of the Holy Spirit and strengthened by the community enough to be able to do that uh, in a really, really fervent basis. What were you thinking during, uh, during the ceremony? Oh my gosh, I was uh, at, the, all, at the beginning, it's all excited, and then when I was laying down on the floor, I was just praying to God and asking God to help me to serve the people of God better and, and to be able to put into practice all the things that I learned at the seminary was just that. One by one, Archbishop Listecki lays his hands over the heads of each candidate, asking the Holy Spirit in silence to fill them with wisdom and grace. Other members of the clergy extend their hands as well. Once formally ordained, the new priests are vested in a stole and chasuble, symbols of their office. As a final symbolic gesture, the Archbishop anoints the palms of the young clerics for sacramental and pastoral service. The Lord, Jesus Christ, whom the Father anointed with the Holy Spirit and power, guard and preserve you, that you may sanctify the Christian people and offer sacrifice to God. Celebration of the Eucharist and offering the sacrament of confession will be among their most important priestly roles in the church. St. John Vianney once said about celebrating the Mass, if a priest really knew what he was doing, you know, he wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah. Because you're right, it, it, it goes from the common, the natural, into this realm that's so mysterious, so supernatural, so powerful, that if, if, if we were fully aware exactly of what we were doing, if we, you step back to actually think about it, it can quickly become overwhelming. But because God is there and taking over, you're able to, 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 to offer some instruction, some wisdom, some guidance, but most of all, consolation and comfort to help people know the healing that comes through the Sacrament of Reconciliation. Holy Orders to the Priesthood is a solemn and yet joyful occasion. And our, our commitment in terms of the spiritual life is one that can reform us in a way that not only gives us hope for the future, but gives us a new day uh, in, this, in this culture and community. The laying on of hands is a link to the apostolic past and an expression of faith in the future.